Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the founder and CEO of 8th Bridge, Wade Gurton. Thank you. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We've got a really exciting event planned for you. Uh, today, we're releasing Graphite. And uh, Graphite is a uh, brand new social commerce platform that we've been working on for quite a while. Uh, Graphite is the first social commerce platform uh, to be built from the ground up to integrate with your existing channels and your existing systems. Uh, I, th I think it's the most innovative thing that's happened within social commerce since we started the category in 2009. In July of 2009, this was the first product that was ever sold on Facebook. It was a, um, a flower cake sold through the 1-800-Flowers fan page. Uh, it's called Slice of Life. And um, that it started a, an amazing amount of excitement in the industry and in the media uh, that kicked off right around then. Because I think up until this point, there had been really no clear way to monetize social media. And what we just showed the retail industry was, here's a really simple thing to do, I think, back then. You know, there's 250 million users on Facebook in 2009. Maybe you should be able to have a store there and sell to them. I think that's where the excitement kind of kicked off. Um, in fact, the topic was, was so covered that over the next 12 months, Facebook commerce and social commerce was covered more than the war in Afghanistan and the Great, great Recession combined by the media. It's true. But I think, I think a, a, a number of industry insiders and a lot of heads of e-commerce took a look at this and thought, well, for the last five years or so, the only thing really innovative that's kind of moved the needle from a revenue point of view has been mobile. And I think a lot of us looked at social as, as potentially the next wave of online growth. Um, in fact, I, I think that um, the only way that e-commerce will become a significant percentage of your total sales if you're a multi-channel retailer is if you reshape how commerce works and make it uh, a lot more about people than it is about products. So I think the future of e-commerce will be shaped around people, not products. For the last three years, 8th Bridge has been on a mission to reshape e-commerce around people. To us, that means that you should be able to shop where you socialize and socialize where you shop. You should be able to easily express how you feel about a product or an offer from a brand with your friends. And then in return, get a more personalized and better and more social experience from that brand. Um, today, Graphite uh, is being released. And Graphite is finally fulfilling on this vision that we had a few years ago. And we're really excited to show it to you. But before we do that, let's talk candidly a little bit about why social commerce hasn't so far put up the kind of numbers that we all hoped it would have from a revenue point of view. So if we go back to that cake again that, that started this whole thing, we sort of started focused on the portability piece of this. We made it possible to shop on Facebook without leaving. So we brought the store out to the customer rather than the other way around. Um, it was a simple concept. It was on the Facebook fan page of 1-800-Flowers. So you could get to it by typing facebook.com slash 1-800-Flowers. And you could browse the category, uh, product categories, add something to your cart and check out. We made the store so portable at one point that would even run on your home page. So if you're a fan of 100 Flowers, you'd get an offer on your home page in the news feed that looked a little bit like a video thumbnail with a play button on it. And if you press play, it would just expand right in place. It would open a store. You could browse the offer, add an item to your cart, and check out. That was, uh, that's kind of where it all started. And you have to ask yourself, why? Like, why would you shop on Facebook when you could easily just go to 100flowers.com as well? And uh, so a lot of these, these early fan page stores didn't produce a lot of revenue. Um, there were a few that did. So um, Hot Look launched an event with us for DVF. Uh, they sold a dozen Diane Von Furstenberg dresses for half off. They blew through a $200,000 worth of sales within, uh, within a day and a half or two days. So shopping does work. Commerce does work on Facebook, but only in certain circumstances. So if you give someone a really big incentive to buy something half off, or you launch a new season of products only on Facebook, or you launch a product that's only available on Facebook. Those types of things have worked really well. But overall, this wasn't really f fulfilling the kind of the vision of social commerce. It was just selling in a social place that didn't make, make shopping social. 2010 started to move us a lot closer to that kind of goal. Um, Delta launched a bookings engine, so it was possible to book your flights on Facebook. It was the ad age app of the year in 2010. 
Uh, their CEO said they got more press from launching their Facebook store than from buying Northwest Airlines. It was a huge PR win, but not that many people have booked their flights on Facebook because why would you? It's, it's really no better than booking it on Delta. Um, so really what Delta was after is creating a better experience. So on top of the Acreage platform, they launched a group travel planning app. This is sort of the killer app in travel, if you think about it. Have you ever planned a trip with your friends or your worst, your family? You know how, how, what a nightmare it is. Right? Where are we staying? What flight are we taking in? When do you get in? Um, what, um, what are we going to do the first night? Who's got the car? All that can now be made easier because you can do it all right on Facebook. You can organize the trip. You can invite your friends that you want to have go with you. And the whole thing gets a little bit easier. And yes, you can book your flights too, but that's not really the point. The point was to create a much better experience for their, for their customers. And I thought Delta did a great job. Uh, Lands End did something with us that was pretty neat uh, a couple years ago as well. They made it possible to create a wish list and then share that with your Facebook friends. So now you can more easily buy me something for my birthday from Facebook. Um, Electronic Arts did some really neat things. So when we launched, when they launched uh, Battlefield 3, they ran a social promotion that gave players uh, an incentive to recruit their friends and go buy the new game. Those are good examples of, of kind of participatory or collaborative or social experiences. And Target last fall launched a Halloween app. It's called Ask Your Friends. And uh, it's exactly what it says. It's really easy to ask your friends which costume you should wear for Halloween. And uh, your friends could vote on it, and you'd get polls that would show up. I was a tie between a creepy sock monkey and a hot dog. <laughs> uh, we even made it possible for sales reps to sell on Facebook. So we unleashed thousands of sales reps on the Facebook. I'm sorry. But it was a classy brand. Mark is a division of Avon. It's great merchandise. They're selling uh, very nice makeup to their friends. So, so uh, you know, thousands of their reps were Facebook users. And they're, they are now able to create stores, create offers, share those with their girlfriends, and let their friends shop without leaving Facebook. Last year, we got very involved with the Facebook engineering team as a beta partner for their new custom open graph technology. And um, we launched our first customer, uh, our beta client, which is Ticketmaster, on Graphite um, late in 2011, early 2012. And uh, it was a very cool timeline app. It let you tell your friends that you wanted to attend a concert. It let you invite your friends to go with you. Um, you could easily tell your friends that you bought tickets to go or ask your friends or tell your friends that you want to go see a band. And, um, and then it would show you what all your friends were up to. So you could see events that you, you and your friends have upcoming. And maybe you didn't know a band was coming to town that a friend of yours uh, just bought tickets for. And it shows up in Facebook for you. So it was a much better social experience for uh, ticketing. But what was really neat about this is we, we also used your social graph data to personalize the experience. So the music that you're listening to on Spotify and RDO and, and iHeartRadio the music and the bands your friends had liked and that they were listening to on those social music services was available to us. Um, and, we made, and we used that data to personalize the experience. So instead of just giving you a list of upcoming concerts in your zip code, we would give you a much more tailored and personalized list of upcoming music and bands that maybe you wouldn't have thought to see otherwise. Um, so it was a very, very cool implementation of, uh, of the custom open graph. In fact, TechCrunch, um, of all of the beta partners that launched, and there were a handful of us that launched on the same night, TechCrunch called our app for Ticketmaster the most impressive one because we were the only ones that actually used that graph data to personalize the experience. Those were just a few examples, but over the years, we worked with dozens and dozens of really, really innovative and well-respected brands. Uh, I could say, hands down, that uh, Eightbridge has far more experience in the social commerce space than anyone else uh, in the market. And the, the number one thing that I could say that we've learned is that people drive social commerce, not brands. So if you go back and you added up all of the shopping activity on Facebook over the last couple of years, almost all of it is friend to friend. It's me inviting you to go to a concert, or me inviting you to go on a trip with me, or me trying to recruit you to join me in the new game. That's where the real value is of social commerce. It's sort of obvious, right? It's word of mouth marketing. That's what the value is. You may have seen this article from Bloomberg. It came out, uh, I think, three months ago or so, maybe two months ago. Uh, it was linked, linked to about 35,000, 45,000 times. So if you didn't see it and you're in the industry, I'd be really surprised. 
you know, the article talked about major retailers that had launched Facebook storefronts and that, and that were now closing them because they didn't see enough revenue from them. And um, I had the uh, pleasure of being quoted as giving F Commerce an F in the article. So we probably should have hired a PR agency before I talked to Bloomberg, <laughs> not after. Um, but it's true. So um, a lot of the early attempts around Facebook commerce or more generally social commerce were focused on selling on fan pages and it just didn't work. Most people didn't even know that you had a store on your fan page, so why would they go there to buy something from you? And, and, and then the experience isn't really any better for a lot of these examples that they gave than what you could have gotten on someone's website. So of course that's not gonna work. Um, but if, if you think back one slide when I said people drive social commerce, the key is to get more people to share you with their friends. And really the fundamental problem that social commerce has had is that the, it's been limited from a distribution point of view. Those people that are seeing your shareable offers and using your social apps are using them on the social media sites. It's a Facebook app on Facebook. But actually, if you added up all of the interactions for your brand, very, very few of those are on Facebook. And very few are inside of a Facebook app. Almost all of your customer interactions and conversations today are in your existing channels. They're in your stores. They're on your e-commerce sites. They're even in your call center. Um, so no wonder we're trying to take that 1% of traffic and convert that into something that delivers a, a, a really good ROI. So that's why social commerce hasn't worked very well so far. There have been some attempts to bring social functionality outside of Facebook, and we'll talk about that in, in a second, but that's really what has to happen. Real social commerce scale requires a, more of an integrated approach than what we've seen so far. Um, you need to be able to integrate social into your existing channels where all those people were into your existing systems that support those channels. So the like button was, I think, the most successful approach towards this. It was really easy. You know, it was a couple lines of code. Um, it was very, uh, there was very little friction in someone clicking a button and expressing how they feel to your friends, to their friends, but it just wasn't very expressive. It wasn't very specific. In fact, at one point I wondered, why do people click the like button on products? So we asked 2,500 Facebook users, why do you like a product? And over half, 57%, said they had already bought the product they had used it, and they liked it. They wanted to tell their friends about it. There was a whole bunch of people that would have expressed themselves about your products and shared with their friends if you gave them something more specific, uh, a, a more specific way to express themselves. So the result was you know, millions of products with zero likes. And what does that tell someone that looks at that product? It's not a good social proof uh, uh, benefit. And the last thing we need are more third-party branded sharing buttons on websites. I think these are taking up enough real estate and enough clutter and they're confusing enough as it is. What is really needed is something that's easy to use as a user, it's expressive, and is brand consistent. So if you're on the Oscar de la Renta website, those sharing features should look and feel like Oscar de la Renta. If you're on the Nasty Gal website, they should look very different than Oscar de la Renta. They should look like Nasty Gal. Can't wait to wear a gimme. There are words and actions um, and the look and feel that, are, that can be very brand consistent and brand customized. Same thing with Guitar Center. Um, those are just a few examples. So that's what's, that's what's needed to really scale up social. So it needs to be multi-channel. It needs to be integrated with your existing system. It's, it's gotta be very easy for someone to engage and express how they feel about your offer. And, and it has to be brand consistent. It has to feel like your brand. And I think a lot of people that are watching this have, have thought, well, I, I know this, and, and I know it needs to be integrated across channels, but it's been a bit, it's a very big project from an IT point of view, and we have other pri competing priorities, and the space is new. We're still in the test and learn phase. So the, the last ingredient that's probably the most important to scaling up social commerce is that it has to be easy. It has to be very lightweight from an IT impact point of view to really uh, scale up social commerce. These five requirements became the core design principles behind Graphite. Graphite is the first social commerce platform built from the ground up to be integrated with those existing channels that you have with the 99% of your existing conversation with the systems that support those. And we've done it so that it's really easy to integrate with your existing systems and channels. We have very large brands activating with Graphite right now, very small brands. Very few of them have taken more than 90 minutes of total programming support from IT to get this live, to get this launched. Soon, there'll be over a billion users on Facebook. 
What Graphite will give a brand is an ability to turn those users into advocates and, and have those users start to share you with their friends. And people will share your brand and will share your products with their friends, uh, not because you're giving them points. They're not going to share because you're giving them rewards. Um, the, you don't have to pay them. And, and the last thing they want is some dorky badge from you on their Facebook profile. Right? The reason people will share you with their friends is the same reason people use Facebook. They want to express who they are, the clothes we wear, the car we drive, um, all, and the music we listen to, for example, all say something about who we are, and that's really what Facebook is all about. And the reason we want to express ourselves to our friends is that we all want to be loved and we all want to belong. So there's this incredible opportunity for social commerce because really it shares the same thing. Again, the reason we shop and the re reason we use Facebook is really the same exact thing. Um, so the, the clothes that we buy from Real Allah say something about who we are. The perfume we wear says something. We travel because we want to belong. We want to be with our friends and we want to be loved. The games we play with our friends after our spouses go to bed till 3 o'clock in the morning really is about being with your friends, not about playing a game. The, the, the games we attend in person rather than watching it on TV are about the same thing. And it's why we go to concerts and don't listen to music just on our iPod. So uh, check out this video and you'll get a better sense of what I mean. Oh, thank you. So they, uh, they lived happily ever after, by the way. <laughs> so uh, it, uh, I think we could summarize graphite and say there are three core capabilities that graphite brings. Uh, the first is the ability to create social expressions in multiple different channels. The second is it enable people to shop without leaving Facebook with shoppable stories. And the third is our interest graph API that makes it possible to integrate this with your existing marketing and e-commerce systems and scale up your opportunity with social commerce. Social expressions um, is, is really what drives the advocacy. It gives someone an ability to more specifically express how they feel about your product. And the brand can decide which actions we call, these are called actions that they like to, to deploy. Maybe love or want or own or wearing or war or listening to or attending. Those are the types of actions that, that a brand can, uh, can add to their existing channels. And it makes it easier for me to express how I feel about your offer to my friends. And, and because it's easier, I'll share more. And more of us will bring a lot more advocacy uh, to your brand and a lot more awareness and buzz on Facebook and will result in more traffic back to your website and, and online sales. Uh, we made it really easy um, for someone to engage. So this is deeply integrated with the Facebook custom open graph. 
and the new timeline that they've released for, for users. Um, so now the, the, the most common use case uh, of Graphite will be to enable your existing website with social actions. So on the product detail page, near the add to bag button, the image of the product, you'll now have a few uh, actions, custom actions for the brand. These look and feel like Fashion Co. The marketer decided what their actions would be. Their creative team designed them to our spec. Uh, and they're added to the website really easily. So now from here, I can tell my friends when I'm shopping that I want that red dress or that I potentially own it. We've made it as easy to implement as the Facebook Like button. So your IT team can implement this in less than 90 minutes. Uh, we can just have you go into the dashboard, into the Graphite dashboard, click Get Embed Code, grab the, a few lines of JavaScript, add those to your site, test it, and you're done. It's really, really easy to implement. Uh, we've also designed it so that the business person controls this. It's not an IT tool. It's a tool for the marketer, the e-commerce ops manager. So it's much easier uh, for you to control the data. You can create actions, manage the actions in the creative. And, and I'll show you how easy it is to create an action in a minute. Uh, but the data is an important one. When a customer says that she wants a dress from you to Facebook, that's being posted to the open graph. And the challenge with the open graph is that it's open. So you should think of it as sort of a public graph. There are things that you might not want to share publicly, um, maybe inventory information or pricing or a, or, a, or a special promotion that you don't want everyone to be able to see. Those are all things that you can control with Graphite. You can decide what you want to share with the open graph and what you want to kind of keep private within Graphite. Now, the actions in the creative are really easy to manage. So a marketer or an e-commerce ops manager would log in, in this case, go to the romantic dresses product category and add a love action um, to that category. And then log into the creative plugins manager. Say I'm going to upload some creative for the love button. Pick, pick that creative, and you've got different states like hover or selected or unselected that you can display to a user and add all that right uh, within the dashboard. Um, so there's not a need to create a small IT project to make these changes. You don't have to call anyone to make these changes. The marketer or the ops manager can just do that right inside Graphite. We've also um, implemented a reporting suite, so we give uh, the user some great insights into what's happening um, from a high level of earned media, how, you know, how much traffic is being driven from these social actions back to my website, down to which products are more viral and shareable than others, to which actions have produced more interactions, does the favorite button work better than the love button for dresses, um, you can have different actions associated with different product categories. Obviously, the actions for furniture would look different than the actions for fashion if, uh, if you sell both. And so all that insight is made available to the marketer, and it's really easy to use to see what's going on. And you can use this to A-B test things and maximize the opportunity. So maybe we should be using favorite for dresses and not love, for example. The second core capability is, is something I think is really cool, which is something we've, we've called shoppable stories. When when someone says, I want this product, and we share that to Facebook, we don't share just a link. We actually share a shoppable store. And it enables someone to shop that story on Facebook without actually leaving Facebook. So um, it shows up like this in the news feed. It shows up in the ticker. It shows up in the timeline uh, when you share this to Facebook. And now it's this interactive, um, brand consistent, shoppable story right in the middle of Facebook's homepage. So, um, so Fashion Co. can decide uh, and control that brand experience, that rich shopping experience, right inside Facebook. And from a user point of view, I'd much rather just hit play and expand this and check out what it is that was shared to me uh, versus clicking a link, because a link means leaving. And a lot of people don't want to leave the Facebook experience, so don't make them. Um, in fact, the shoppable stories drive about an 18x lift in interaction rates or click rates versus sharing a link. Because again, we all know what a link does. It means we have to leave Facebook. Uh, brand marketers love this because it's a really rich, controlled brand experience now uh, inside Facebook. We also make it really easy to change that creative. So you can log into the dashboard, um, open up the shoppable stories 
uh, area and upload some different creative if you wanted to try something other than what's on the screen now. And again, this is something that the business user can configure and we, it's not an IT project. So we're changing the header from Fashion Co. in this example to Fashion Co. get 15% off. Those are the types of things that you could do with banners and other, and other creative. The third component of Graphite is really important. It's called the Interest Graph API. And the API is what allows you to scale this up with, exi with other existing systems. So if you wanted to integrate this interest graph data, the information that you know about that someone wanted this item or they, or they love this item or they already own this item, that's all relevant insight and very useful to use in your existing marketing e-commerce systems. And what, with that information, you can create a better experience that's more social in each channel that you have and personalize those. I think the two most common use cases right now for the interest graph API are around email and product recommendations. So in email, uh, through the Interest Graph API, we could trigger an email to someone that wanted an item. So if Melissa wanted, she, she clicked want on your website and said, I want this red dress. When it goes on sale, send it to her. So we can automatically trigger an email out uh, to Melissa to let her know that that item she wanted is now on sale. The other one is product recommendations. So the product recommendations engine that you use now can be made smarter by give, giving it interest graph data. So if, again, if I wanted those skinny jeans uh, and I'm on your website, then shouldn't those skinny jeans show up in a recommended products pane? Absolutely, it should. So that's, that's your quick intro uh, to Graphite. Now I'd like to introduce a few of the key players behind the product. We've got some amazing, brilliant people on the team, and I'd like you to meet just a couple of them now. What the new Graphite platform brings is a friend-to-friend, -friend, scalable, repeatable process that's lights out. And more importantly, this is going to be friend-to-friend -friend sharing at the long-tail product level. A lot of social commerce strategies today focus on trying to give people deals or giving them badges or making a game out of it. People share on Facebook because they want to express who they are. Oftentimes, expressing what you own and sharing what you own or what you aspire to own can often express who you are better than your own words can. Brands have been very reluctant to allow users to really express themselves. What the Graphite platform brings are two very important things. Not only is the user interface for the actions consistent with the brand message, but the vocabulary of each one of those verbs can be tailored to the company and really communicate the brand feel and mimic what their advocates like to express about that brand. We wanted to build something that a marketer could add their actions, design the creative around it, A-B test it. If they want those changes to go live, it's as simple as deploying it out to production. With Graphite, you won't need to call IT anymore. We built Graphite to make sure that it was really easy for the merchant to deploy and put on their website. A simple few lines of JavaScript code added to your product pages and you're able to add social commerce actions to your site. No merchant should take lightly a request to just add more code to their product pages. Keeping your product pages light and easy and fast is really important. When we designed Graphite, we made sure that we used the most advanced techniques possible to load that plugin asynchronously in a way that would never cause your page to slow down at all. To do that, we created a suite of plugins that the web developer or the marketing manager in that organization can use to create social actions and then put those on a product page. And now, when your friends visit your timeline, they're gonna be able to see all of the items that you've wanted, maybe that you've loved, maybe that you've actually marked and, and shared with your friends that you own. When this share occurs, Graphite has um, something that we call a shoppable story, which is actually a mini catalog that will open up in timeline, ticker, and newsfeed. And this allows us to show products personalized to that share, and it's almost a brand new channel for the retailer. We made this very flexible and easy for the marketer to change and experiment with social commerce, but it's a very easy integration for IT so if you've added a Facebook like button, a tweet button, any other Google Analytics, you have already done the exact same amount of work that it takes to add the Graphite plugin. 
Many people have avoided doing social projects because they know that APIs can change at a moment's notice and things require constant maintenance. We made sure that we wouldn't require any kind of complicated data transfers or catalog exports. The way that we add data to the Graphite database is a process we call hydration. Hydration can happen in many ways. The easiest way is having open graph tags on your page already. You have a title, a description, and an image. That's product data. We'll read it, and you're done. This allows our merchant partners to go live very quickly and create a very durable product for the long term. The Graphite platform is going to enable a whole new strategy on how we market in this day of social integration. We have analytics for every step of this earned media funnel, from how many people see actions, to how many people take actions, to how many of those actions actually get into a Facebook news feed, and then finally the click back to the site. And we believe that this true trackability of this earned media funnel is one of the things that will really bring ROI into social commerce. Right, well that's, uh, that's your quick intro to Graphite. Uh, we have a speaker now, his name is Paul Barker. And uh, Paul is the Vice President and the General Manager for uh, Hallmark Digital. And Hallmark is one of our very first clients as uh, Eighth Bridge. And, uh, They've, they've been um, a very innovative company in the social commerce space and done a number of really interesting things and, uh, and are one of our launch partners for Graphite. So Paul's going to join us from a Hallmark card store in Kansas City, and he'll talk a little bit about their overall strategy, um, how they look at multi-channel, and uh, how they look at social commerce and what some of their plans might be with Graphite. Well, we're excited to be included in the 8th Bridge launch uh, later this month. Uh, it's another example of Hallmark's interest in trying to experiment and learn within the Facebook environment. There aren't many brands that were born over 100 years ago that are still around today. It's been a business that's been built on helping people say what they don't know how to say themselves, particularly at those milestone moments. So Hallmark is chasing a multi-channel strategy right now. We have over 40,000 points of distribution at retail, but we also know we need to be relevant in the digital space. And Facebook has clearly been one of the places where our target consumer gravitates. This whole notion of understanding how e-commerce can operate within the social media space is really intriguing to us. Our business is really about relationships, and I think one of the things we've learned is that your friends and your family are the ones that can influence your online behavior and in-store behavior. So we feel like we need to be there with a relevant solution. Our current marketing campaign is focused on life as a special occasion, and we want to make sure that people look to Hallmark as a way of connecting and celebrating for those little moments in life. One of the things that we're excited about with uh, what 8th Bridge is bringing is the ability to create buttons that are more expressive than just like or share. Some of our product is funny and it would be great to have people have the option to say LOL, laugh out loud about this product. Things like laugh or love or a whole suite of emotional tags on product can really help spread the word about what Hallmark has to offer. We're a brand about emotions and feelings, no matter how people choose to express them. And in the digital space, it's changing almost every day. And so we feel like in order to be relevant, we've got to jump in and be there where our shoppers are. And we think some of the things that we're doing with 8th Bridge helps us do that. We're making it easy for them to connect and communicate, and we're making it personalizable or enabling them to be personalized or customize their solutions in the social media space. And it's just a nice uh, opportunity for Hallmark to play a role in the Facebook timeline where we can be naturally a part of uh, people's lives in all of those big events, but also the little events that occur every day. So uh, a big thanks to Paul for doing that video with us. Next up, we have the uh, privilege of being visited by Sucharita Mulperu. Sucharita is the Vice President and the Principal Analyst for e-commerce at Forrester Research. And uh, we're really glad to have her here today. Sucharita is going to talk to us a little bit about where Forrester sees social commerce going. So uh, please give it up for Sucharita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thanks so much, Wade. So uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I am uh, particularly, uh, you know, I think that this is an interesting perspective for me to have because I have been in a lot of ways um, a critic of social commerce because so many of the retailers and the companies that, that I've worked with and that I've talked to um, really themselves had have had a lot of concerns around things like Facebook commerce and whether or not um, what is typically comprised of social commerce really it's a it's a revenue generator or not and uh, and one of the things that's really interesting and unique about this time that we're in now are so many of the developments that we've seen in the last few months Months, and so many of the changes, in particular with how consumers now have the capability of sharing, um, that's where the next generation of, of social commerce opportunities appears to be. That's where there is the greatest traction. And, uh, and, it's, and it's a very different story than, than what we've seen before, which is, which is, which is great. And that's what um, Wade spent a lot of time talking about this morning. And I'll step back and give a little bit of a 30,000 foot perspective on, on the perspective that I've seen from the industry and what retailers have shared um, with me. Now, over the last several years, um, there have probably been two primary lessons about social commerce that have come away that I think are very, very good um, bases to have for what is now the new wave of social commerce. And, uh, and then we'll talk about um, you know, kind of the latter part of this presentation being what's new right now and what is it that is so unique and different from what had happened before and why things are more effective than they, they'd ever been. So um, just kind of stepping back and looking at the things that did work about social commerce, because Wade spent a lot of time this morning talking about many of the things that you know, were experiments that didn't quite bear out to be what, uh, you know, kind of what companies and brands had, had hoped that they would be. Um, but really, uh, the, the two big takeaways are, are these. First and foremost, that, that the best customers for any given brand or marketer or retailer really happens on one's own properties. Um, so that happens on a retailer or a brand's own website or their own communities or on their own properties that consumers go to as destinations. And that's really what the data here is. This was um, a survey, a set of surveys <clears throat> that Forrester had done with interactive marketers in the US and Europe asking marketers where was the deepest level of engagement there, that their consumers had had um, across a variety of different properties, whether it was the primary website or whether a blog or other social properties like Facebook or Twitter. And you can see that across the board, the own primary website was a, a far, far distant first with respect to where that level of the deepest engagement really was. Now, when I step back and kind of apply that to thinking about, well, when we, when we think about what is social commerce, social commerce is so much more than simply just a Facebook page or a Facebook store, even things like ratings and reviews. And um, when I had uh, worked with retailers to kind of gather what that picture was, it was, it was a whole series of things. And this is, this is a bit of, um, of a laundry list of, of everything that, that we kind of consider to be social commerce. And, uh, and this was a framework that we had put together to kind of give companies um, a, a way to think about how they should prioritize various social tactics. This is a framework at Forrester that we call our tech radar. And uh, anytime there are several sub-technologies within a larger meta-technology, um, this framework is there to help identify what has the greatest impact and where are various technologies on the evolution of, uh, of of um, creation to, to um, kind of decline. Um, and that's really what the data here is. So there are two axes along the x-axis. It's where is that particular technology um, from the continuum from birth to death, um, you know, based on the fact that there's usually a peak period somewhere in, in between that. And then on the y-axis, where is that technology from an effectiveness standpoint? And we bucket everything into a really, really high level set of, of buckets of high, medium, and low value. And, uh, and, and that's what the high value is, is the, 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 gra the, the line that is the blue, and then the lowest value is where the red is. Now, as you can see, there are a variety of different tactics there, ranging from ratings and reviews to social recommendations, which are the collaborative filtering consumers who liked X also like Y, that type of sharing. 
um, the product sharing on the social networks, open APIs, employee networks. So everything that we could think of mapped along here. Now, if I had to draw a circle around as far to the upper right-hand part of the quadrant as we could get, because really, um, you know, you always in any quadrant want to be on that upper right, it would ultimately end up being these eight tactics. And um, I'm not going to go through every single one of them in excruciating detail because um, you know we could, but um, but I think that uh, you, you know a lot of these are, are kind of self-evident. But if I had to take away, a, a, you know, probably the sig single biggest takeaway for these eight tactics, it is that six of the eight tactics are tactics which happen on the retailer's own site. So again, thinking about those owned properties. So looking back to that first slide about the marketer who said that by and large, our primary website is where our consumers are engaging with us the most. And then looking at retailers who actually have implemented different parts of the social commerce spectrum and looking at what's the most effective, again, it just reinforces that, that the own site, what happens and what starts with your own customers, with your own employees, with people who are visiting and engaging and are your brand enthusiasts where they, they, they are, that's where the biggest impact is. Now, there are a couple of other elements that are, that are outside, um, the, you know, kind of the site, things like microblogs, which are essentially the Twitter feeds, um, social shopping aggregator sites, companies that are third-party aggregators of, uh, of user-generated content. But for the most part, everything else is about your own consumers or your own employees creating content um, or creating some sort of, uh, of information or data that then gets circulated through a social network or some sort of a social feedback forum that then ultimately adds value back to that retail site. The second big lesson that, that social commerce really for the last several years has kind of, uh, you know, kind of come forward with is, is how important sharing is to the equation and how important the peer-to-peer -peer aspect that Wade had talked about is to what is social commerce. And uh, this very specifically was data that I had um, gathered from online shoppers. I worked with the BizRate Insights to actually pull this information. So the reason why the BizRate Insights part is important is because they essentially do post-transaction surveys of people who have just completed transactions. So this, this is several thousand people who are recent online shoppers talking about their attitudes toward social commerce and, and toward uh, you know, kind of sharing their product, their favorite products on social networks. And I'd actually gone into this research hypothesizing, because remember, I was the skeptic about social commerce, that people don't really care about products that get shared, that you just kind of ignore them, or that you, in a worst case scenario, you just kind of unfollow that person, or you decide that you're going to ignore what they say. And the exact opposite actually surfaced in the data, which was really eye-opening to me, and, and I think is probably one of the, the biggest reasons that companies like Pinterest um, have really exploded in, uh, in, in recent months, which is that most people, or a significant portion, I shouldn't say, you know, kind of most, it's not quite over 50%, but a lot of consumers love to see what their friends like. And they like to discover things. They like to discover products, sales, promotions, new, you know, new trends through what is sharing. And in fact, when you look at the negative comments, they're relatively small. The percent of consumers that are agreeing with statements like, oh, I ignore these updates, or I don't like these posts, is, is a significantly smaller percent than the percent of consumers that actually find themselves engaged with the process of discovery. So to be able to, to, to really hook on to those two nuggets, the fact that it's about your own owned properties and the fact that people like sharing and people like what their friends share, that's really where the, the, the big insights with respect to, well, well, why did we have challenges with social commerce over the last few years and what's so different about what's now? Now, what I will say is that we have had you know, some, some inklings and some beginnings to the, to, the, to the share capabilities. That's what the Facebook like button was all about. And, uh, and this is a lot of, of the reinforcement of what Wade had talked about earlier. But really, um, you know, I'll just kind of you know, reinforce that and, and share with you a little bit of my perspective as to what, it ha what, what has and hasn't worked over the last few years. And, with respect to the sharing that's happened to date, 
Um, while it has been effective in that it is one of the, it was, it was regarded as one of the, the top eight social commerce tactics, um, it was still limited in the capabilities. It was limited in its distribution. And the four things that really limited it were that one is the, just the, 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 the sheer nature of the parameter of what you could share. And in fact, um, you know, for the most part, the only thing that you could really do with Facebook was, was just the like. Um, and the like was, was certainly something that is, uh, you know, resonated with, with millions and millions of consumers, but the problem is that it was still relatively flat, wasn't customizable, and really had a lot of issues, particularly with brands or retailers or any company that perceived itself as not necessarily wanting to be associated with Facebook, or they didn't really see themselves as a brand that would be liked or a product that would be liked. They wanted to have more dimension. Um, and, and up until now, they didn't really have that capability of, uh, of having something that was, was more unique. And you saw some of the examples earlier of, of how that richness now exists. Um, what that ended up doing is that also limited the volume of sharing that ultimately happened because you not only had constraints around how many sites were willing to do this type of activity, but you also, from a consumer standpoint, only gave consumers that one parameter to like it. Um, there weren't other things related to potentially wanting or um, you know, kind of giving more dimension to uh, aspiring to something versus um, you know, kind of simply liking. The third piece um, was that ultimately that has an impact on discovery. And if you don't have as much sharing, that obviously limits the number of people that then um, get exposed to this particular product or this particular brand or this particular uh, message um, through, through any type of a discovery process. And the fourth piece is, uh, is that data collection was significantly challenged. And we'll spend some time talking about the value of data and the numbers and what all of this information can ultimately yield. Um, but the reality is, is that a significant part of what frustrated marketers about a lot of what was social commerce version one um, was that they didn't even really know the level or the activity of, of sharing that was happening. There was not a lot of great data around who was sharing or what, whether that was even ultimately yielding sales. So, so all of that, um, it, you know, kind of fed on itself and, and, you know, kind of created an inkling of something with promise, but really wasn't the home run that. That, uh, that we were looking for in the social commerce world. But we have a new era now, and there are new developments, there are new opportunities, the open graph is a significant part of that, and, uh, and that's really what, what Wade had spoken um, about much of this morning. Um, but if I had to step back and look at what is it about the issues that didn't work in the past that now have changed, it's almost the, the exact antithesis of the challenges now being addressed and the shortcomings now becoming strengths. And the first and foremost difference is really the capability to customize and to be able to put new buttons that consumers or brand enthusiasts can now um, use to really highlight the emotions that they have about a particular brand. And, and we saw many of them earlier today, and we saw them actually customized in really unique ways for brands as diverse as those in the luxury world to those who are more contemporary and fun. Um, but these are just the examples of, uh, of, of some of that, that diversity and the ability to customize everything from not just the verbiage to the font to the color, um, all of those ultimately lead to that ability of the brand to really provide the level of expression that, that they had probably always sought and that, that many of um, any brand's brand enthusiasts ultimately um, you know, are likely to respond to. The second and third point, again, go back to you know, how much volume and how much more product discovery results. Um, as a result of, of not just these, um, these new messages that can be communicated, but also just the seamlessness of sharing and the ability to take advantage of consumers who may already be logged in without having to explicitly force an additional set of keystrokes in order to encourage that login. Um, that really encourages a significant part of the, the sharing that happens. We see that on sites like the Washington Post or Spotify. Um, and what results from that is the greater discovery, the richer, more frequent sharing that ultimately happens, where as a consumer just simply, you know, kind of uh, 
pins something or says that they like something or they say that they want something that that just automatically goes and it uh, it has that capability of, of really really amplifying the amount of, of views and the ultimately the amount of traffic that comes back to a given site and uh, and that's really you know kind of some of the data that um, that I thought replicated that and, and, and kind of reinforced some of that information that we had talked about earlier. Just a couple of examples, and this is publicly available information that, uh, that I just pulled from compete.com, but a couple of uh, illustrations of companies that in particular saw some of that explosion of traffic as a result of some of this, this usage of uh, the custom open graph and the ability to have some of that seamless sharing um, were in the Washington Post and fab.com, and I'll talk about both of them separately. In the case of the Washington Post, which is a really, really interesting example, um, because it is a traditional media company, which, you know, like so many media players, you know, just has challenges with attracting traffic and, and in the world of, of fragmented media, um, really continuing to drive a significant amount of traffic, which, of course, is, is ultimately the, the objective of, uh, of that site. But if you look at around the time when the open graph was implemented, around the, the um, fall, the late summer, early fall time period, we see a consistent growth in traffic to that site. And uh, there were some spikes earlier in the year, but you know, kind of inconsistent with you know, kind of the trend. But when we see, you know, kind of as a result of, of the open graph implementation, um, that consistent growth upward, that's what's really remarkable. Because then what you go back to is that this is the, the earlier part of the year. This is a year later um, from the beginning to the end, an enormous growth in year over year traffic that is not only kind of a consistent upward trend, but a significant overall growth in the volume that that, that site sees. Um, in the case of a retail player like fab.com, um, flash sale site that uh, you, you know kind of uh, also has a lot of great photography and a lot of great images, also around the same time when they started to implement, you know, kind of the ability to have the seamless sharing of images and you know kind of liking something or you know kind of sharing something um, and just promoting it to to one's uh, social network. We also see this explosion in traffic that just literally happens over a very, very short period of time. And, uh, and that's, that's really what um, kind of the takeaway here is, is that, is that this, is, this is the big so what of, of all of this, is that the amount of traffic generation, the amount of volume that consistently these sites have been able to generate as a result of, of their own fans, their own brand enthusiasts, essentially sharing the word about specific products and ultimately about the company, um, that's what this is really ultimately a reflection of. Now, the fourth part, which is perhaps one of the most important components here, is that now we also have the capability of having data become a bigger part of the ROI equation. And the reason that I say that is that when we even step back and look at, you know, kind of what are all of the, the capabilities that Facebook has to offer to a brand or specifically to, to a retailer, I bucket it into three different places. We bucket it into everything that's on Facebook. And that was kind of, you know, social commerce version 1.0, where it was everything that was happening within the metaphorical four walls of Facebook. It was the Facebook stores, Facebook fan pages. And I kind of put it at the bottom of this, this chart here because for the most part, this was also where the least value to a lot of retailers came. And that was all of the things that, that Wade had referred to this morning that were some of those challenges. Now, we started to see more value, and that's where a lot of this kind of sharing um, and the traffic value is coming from, where we see a lot of the off-Facebook capabilities. It's all of the, the, um, the, 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 the customization of the, the buttons and the sharing that comes as a result of that that we're, we're seeing kind of going up in the ladder. But where I really see some of the most value to actually come out of this in, and where I think that there's the greatest level of, of opportunity is in the data layer. And it's looking at all of the information that consumers are now sharing with you and taking advantage of that in every way that it can be taken advantage of. So it's looking at things like 
well, where are their product development opportunities? Or where are things trending? So really looking at you know, kind of how you can take advantage of the information that then ends up um, as a result of, uh, of, of, of a lot of the sharing and, uh, and, and taking advantage of it in one's own way. Um, and the reason why so much of the value and the ROI part of the equation needs to come through the data piece is, is frankly, it's because of um, you know, kind of what the so what here of this data is, which is the reality is, is that even though there's a lot of traffic that often is coming to these sites, and we saw the examples uh, like fab.com and the Washington Post of, of traffic resulting from sharing, much of that is very top of the funnel traffic. It's about discovery and it's about um, consumers realizing that something exists where they may not have realized it before. Um, the challenge is ultimately how that leads to and ultimately drives transactions. And when we actually explicitly ask people, and this was sort of a couple of months, probably a couple of, yeah, it was probably a few months into um, kind of the, the initial custom graph implementations kind of coming about, um, pretty consistently, very, very few consumers actually ultimately complete transactions as a result of explicitly having seen a link from a social network. Um, and that's what the data here really reflects, is that this was holiday data last year, looking at people who had purchased during a very specific period of time. And the big takeaway is that you know ultimately, when we look at what is the interactive marketing tactic that can be related to that sale, it typically is either email or consumers just visiting a site organically. Um, but that obviously doesn't mean that the social experience was not relevant to that because we know that there's a significant amount of upstream traffic that these sites are now generating. The challenge is how do you tie that back to the sale? So there are two ways to do that. One is that you basically broaden the attribution window so that it's no longer a 14 or a 30 day window, but you broaden that time frame to several months because that's likely what the, uh, the time period is between um, discovery to actually transaction. Um, but the other value is looking at how else can you take advantage of the information that you've gleaned from that sharing? And, uh, and what else does that tell you about how things are trending, what, po what items are popular, what items do consumers want to see more of, what items are ultimately shareable? Um, and when we look at sort of, you know, kind of how, how do you make sure that you're making the most out of kind of social commerce 2.0, um, really taking advantage of, of what is there for, um, for, for, for the best of, of, of all worlds, it's, uh, it's these four things. One is, is that ultimately you have to honestly assess the viral nature of your products. And to make the most of a good social sharing platform, you realize that not all products are necessarily viral, and not all products are viral in the same way. And certain um, types of, uh, of, of marketing messages may resonate more in certain types of forums, like Twitter versus Facebook versus Pinterest, um, and taking advantage of, of understanding what it is that's fundamentally viral. Um, realizing that certain types of brands um, definitely attract much more um, energy and enthusiasm, and certain types of products simply may not. And, uh, and to recognize that, uh, that, that you need to take advantage of the ones that, that certainly have more of a viral component, because not every product does. Um, the second is how important it is for a brand marketer themselves to seed and feed the good content. And what that means is taking advantage of knowing what are those best products and putting it out there yourself so that so that that kind of gets the, you know, it's kind of the, you know, kind of stoking the, 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 the embers and, uh, and getting it out there so that it's not just kind of left to its own. You do definitely need to, to cultivate the experience and to ensure that people do know what, uh, what it is that is definitely worth sharing. The third point is to recognize and reward your power users. Um, and the value there is to make sure that some of those brand enthusiasts recognize that they're loved, that they are being listened to, that they're adding value. Because the worst thing that, and one of the, the common experiences that we often even saw in Social Commerce 1.0 was that we would often see these brand enthusiasts participating, but then if they themselves didn't get the recognition or they didn't get necessarily the feedback from the company that they were providing value, they'd either go to another format or they would stop 
participating at the level that they were participating in. And those power users are incredibly critical for not only seeding the content, but continuing to keep um, the enthusiasm going. We, we typically know that a minority, usually around 20% or so, of those people, of the shares that happen, um, typically are going to come from, from you know, kind of that minority. Look, I should say the, major, the majority of shares typically come from a minority like a percent or in, in the neighborhood of 20% of the, the, the users. The last bit is uh, to monitor behavior, and this is where the data piece comes in, to continue to monitor behavior, match any data that you have back to your master customer file so that you can get to that level of the data layer extraction and the data layer intelligence, which is so important for not only continuing to grow your brand, but also to think about how you can continue to grow wallet share and acquire new customers. Um, and with that, I will uh, thank you for your time, and uh, hopefully you found this, this valuable and useful. This is my contact information, and uh, I will give the microphone back to Wade. Thank you. Thank you, Sucharita. That, uh, that was very good. Um, I now have the, the great pleasure of introducing you to our launch partners. We've, uh, we've been working with over a dozen uh, major brands, really innovative companies uh, and great people on the launch of Graphite. Some of them are live now, and, uh, and some will be going live over the coming days. Uh, here they are. We're, uh, we're very proud to be working with these companies and, uh, and, the, and the thought leaders within each of them. Each company shares our vision uh, for reshaping e-commerce around people. And, uh, and each of them is using Graphite in their own way to create custom social shopping experiences on their current websites and their current channels. And, and I think these launch partners and other partners that leverage Graphite are going to unleash a wave of advocacy that the e-commerce space has never seen before. So thank you a lot for joining us today. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun introducing Graphite to you. I wanted to say thank you to the 8th Bridge team as well um, and the families behind the, the, the Graphite team. We, we couldn't have done this without you, so thank you very much. Uh, now we're going to leave you with some fun examples of how some of our launch partners are leveraging Graphite to unleash advocacy for their brands. Thanks a lot. <laughs>